Up until now, we've discussed supply and demand in a free market where we can have prices adjust to the level where everybody that wants to purchase something at the prevailing market price can actually do so because we have a condition at a free market equilibrium where the quantity demanded of an item and the quantity supplied of an item are the same. Now we're going to look at various government policies that move markets away from this equilibrium outcome and analyze what happens to the demand and the supply. The first ones that we're going to look at are known as price ceilings and price floors. Let's start with price ceilings. Now a price ceiling is intuitively what you think that it would be. A price ceiling is a legally mandated maximum price. So like a ceiling, you can't go above it. So we're saying when we set a price ceiling, which we represent as a horizontal line on our supply and demand diagram, because it just happens at one particular price, what we're really saying is you can only be in this range down here in terms of prices. So for example here, the only allowable prices are from this line down. And for this price ceiling here, the only allowable prices are from this line down. So it really is like a ceiling or a roof or something like that. We distinguish between two cases here. One where the price ceiling is what we call binding, or where it actually affects the market outcome. Because you can see here, in our natural state, we would want our market price to be here. This is going to be our free market outcome. So with this price ceiling here, if we're restricting our prices to be below it, we've excluded this free market outcome. So we're actually having an effect on the market. On the other hand, if we set our price ceiling up here, we're saying, oh, well, the price can't go above this line here. Well, the market didn't want it to go above that line anyway. So this is going to be what we call a non-binding price ceiling. In general, we can say that if we set our price ceiling at a price below the free market equilibrium price, that that price ceiling is going to be binding. And if we set our price ceiling at or above the free market equilibrium price, then that price ceiling is going to be non-binding. Now, you may ask, well, why would you ever set a price ceiling that's going to be non-binding? Because when that price ceiling is set, well, it's basically irrelevant to the market. And the answer is that sometimes non-binding price ceilings are set sort of like safeguards to say, well, the market outcome, the price is okay now, but we want to protect it from getting too high in the future. Because if you think about it, you could have either an increase in demand or a decrease in supply that would push up the equilibrium price, in which case you might be bumping up against this non-binding price ceiling. So it's quite possible that a price ceiling that's non-binding today might actually be binding tomorrow. The opposite is also true in that a price ceiling that's binding today, you could see either an increase in supply or a decrease in demand that could make this price ceiling non-binding in the future. So let's think about what happens in our market once we put a binding price ceiling into place. As an example, we can think of this maybe as, I don't know, a price ceiling on the price of gasoline. Now, it seems intuitively that stating a maximum price for gasoline should be a good thing because we all like cheap gas, but we want to understand what's actually going to happen in the market and whether we can really have everything that we want at a lower price. So let's analyze the situation. Here we had an original market price in quantity and then we said a binding price ceiling was one where the price ceiling was below the normal equilibrium price. So what happens here, rather than the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded coming together in a normal equilibrium like we saw here, we have a permanent wedge between the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded. You'll notice that the price will try to get as close to the original equilibrium as possible, so it will bump up against this price ceiling. And the equilibrium, if you want to call that, steady state price, will be at this P star here, which is just the amount of the price ceiling. At this price ceiling, we notice that the quantity demanded is where the demand curve intersects the price ceiling, which is all the way out here. 
but the quantity supplied is only here, where the supply curve intersects the price ceiling. Now the reason for this is while lower prices induce consumers to want to buy, lower prices also cause producers to shift their resources elsewhere. So what we get here is a gap between the quantity demanded and the quantity supplied, which we call a persistent shortage. To calculate the amount of the shortage, we just say, well, that's how much bigger the quantity demanded is than the quantity supplied, because the quantity demanded is the bigger number here. If we want to think about the actual number of units that are transacted when a price ceiling is in place, it's helpful to remember that in order to have a trade, you have to have both supply and demand present. So up to this quantity here, you have both supply and demand. But then from this quantity out to this quantity, you have demand, but you have no supply. So no trades are happening there. And the quantity transacted with our price ceiling is actually this quantity here, which is the same as the quantity supplied because we can say that the quantity transacted is really the minimum of the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded. So what we see as a result of our price ceiling is that some people will be able to get their cheap gasoline, but they'll be waiting at the gas station to get it maybe lined up, and there will be people at the back of that line that would like to have their gasoline at this price, but won't be able to get it because there's not enough supply to meet the demand that's out there. So some people with this price ceiling will get left out in the cold. And we don't know a whole lot about whether the people that get left out in the cold are the ones that value the good the most, the least. We really have no idea. It's kind of random at this point unless we put additional regulations in place. Also, in economics, we say that the true cost of something is what you have to give up in order to get it. So under this price ceiling situation, it may not even be the case that this price ceiling represents the true all-inclusive cost of getting the item. And the reason for that is if there's a shortage, chances are there are going to be lines and backups and back orders, things like that, and not everyone is going to be able to immediately get the product, even if they will be able to eventually, and they're in this lucky area of the graph here. Now, our time isn't free because we could be doing productive things with that time that we instead spent standing in line. So the true cost when we have a shortage isn't even properly represented by this price ceiling here. In that way, we say, well, not only did we cause a shortage and leave some people out in the cold, even the people that are getting the item aren't realizing the full benefits of the lower price.